Hi, and welcome back to Tax Wars with Don and Nicole. We've got a really, really great episode for you today. Uh, we have a guest today. Actually, this is our first guest for yes. Nicole and I. So we're highly excited. It's someone I've had a relationship with uh, in the tax industry for well over a decade. Uh, however, we're going to introduce him shortly. But first, we want to talk about the upcoming event that we have this weekend in Las Vegas. I'll let Nicole tell you about that. We are going to Viva Las Vegas, both Nicole and I. So what's that date, Nicole, and when are we going to be there, and what are we going to be doing? It's the Sunday through Wednesday, and it's the NAEA convention. So we'll be out there learning new things about taxes, uh, visiting with the tax commissioner, and just having a great time in Las Vegas with all of our fellow tax professionals. Oh, by golly gosh, for those people who don't know what NEA stands for, Nicole, National let's set some light. National Association of Enrolled Agents. Did you hear that? National Association of Enrolled Agents. Nicole is an enrolled agent, or at least she plays one on TV. Yes. So um, uh, with, if you're going to be there, please feel free, uh, comment down in the comment section, send us an email. Uh, we would love to meet up with you yeah. while you're there. We are looking for uh, a tax professionals, tax attorneys, CPAs, and enrolled agents to join our channel, join our team. And uh, without much ado at this point in time, we'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce you to our wonderful guest, uh, Rand, tax attorney Randy Salter, who has tons of experience. He's going to be talking about uh, what that uh, the 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 uh, term that no one likes to talk about in the tax resolution industry, which is the OIC, the Offer and Compromise. So we're going to be going over that, and he's got some great information in terms of how to handle the Offer and Compromise, what tax professionals sometimes forget, what most tax professionals don't know, and what they almost never do properly to get an offer accepted and through the IRS in a timely fashion for their client. So uh, if you have trouble with doing offer and compromises, Mr. Salter is going to be shedding some light. Uh, and if you have comments uh, or questions, you're going to be able to get a hold of him, and he may be able to uh, help you in, uh, in, in handling offers uh, with the IRS and also with the state. So at this time, uh, Randy, we'd like to go ahead and introduce you. Um, first off, uh, say hello to everyone on our YouTube channel. And uh, let them know, uh, give them your, your, your uh, uh, tell them a little bit about yourself and uh, how long have you been working in the tax industry and what you like most about it. Sure. So, yeah. So uh, I've actually been uh, practicing law for the last 32 years. Um, and uh, I uh, have been working in the tax resolution industry for almost 20 years. Uh, so 20 years ago, uh, I had been doing civil litigation and contracts law, uh, and a friend of mine came to me and said he had a big tax problem, and he owed about $300,000 in payroll taxes for his company and absolutely had no idea what to do. Uh, I suggested we go and talk to a, a friend of mine who did tax law. Uh, he was a tax attorney. He didn't do tax resolution necessarily, but he said, oh, yeah, he goes, uh, you know, you can do an offer and compromise. Just uh, here, fill out these paperworks. Uh, you know, this paperwork and uh, sent it in. And, uh, you know, so my friend filled out the paperwork. I looked it over. I gave it to the uh, to the tax attorney and uh, he sent it in and it uh, forthwith got rejected. Uh, none of it was done correctly. And I just said, you know, this is ridiculous. Let me do a little research. And I learned how the offer and compromise program works and learned the intricacies of it by reading some articles, uh, looking over the forms and things like that. And we went ahead and resubmitted the offer after it had been rejected. And within seven months, uh, and it does take a little bit of time, uh, that offer was accepted and his 300 and some odd thousand dollar uh, payroll tax liability was reduced to $30,000. And they gave him some time to pay that off and he was able to save his business and uh, save his tax situation. So uh, after I did that, uh, a friend of mine who worked in a large uh, tax resolution firm said, you know, you're quite good at this. You should come talk to us and come work with us. And so I, uh, I started an interview with this company. I, I started working for them. Within two years, I was their supervising uh, resolution attorney. And uh, I stayed there for quite a while. And um, ultimately, 
I just decided I was going to do this on my own because uh, I knew how to do the work. And uh, I just felt that the gigantic tax firms that are out there, you know, that have uh, taking on 70, 80, 90 clients uh, a week sometimes, uh, just don't have the staff to be able to do a good job. And I knew that I could do a good job on my own and uh, take on fewer clients and really think about their cases. So that's how I got into it. And so an offer and compromise was the very first uh, resolution issue that I had to deal with uh, as a tax attorney. And uh, it was actually really exciting. I love the work I do. Fantastic, Randy. And uh, just so our, our audience of tax professionals out there know, uh, I, uh, I have uh, interacted with Randy on, on, on some cases and uh, he is very, very good at communicating with clients and um, uh, keeping them abreast in terms of what's happening with the case. Because an offer, an offer case, the average offer case can take how many months, Randy, to get through? Yeah, so for the simplest of offer cases, it's going to take six to seven months. Uh, that's where a taxpayer owns no real estate, uh, owes less than $50,000. Um, but if they owe more than $50,000, if they have real estate, if they're self-employed, if they own a business, uh, if they have uh, other complexities uh, for their situation, then, you know, something like that could take up to a year uh, of back and forth uh, negotiations and, uh, and processes that the IRS has you go through uh, when you're in the offer and compromise program. So I've had some offers go through very quickly in five or six months. Uh, and get an offer accepted without even having to do an appeal. Others were rejected uh, at the six or seven or eight month mark, and we ended up having to appeal uh, that rejection, and that offer ended up taking almost uh, 14, 15 months before we actually were able to get the offer accepted. When you, uh, what process do you go through uh, prior to determining, uh, because uh, this is some of the things that many tax practitioners don't take the time to do to do the research on the client and the case to determine that they're actually an offer candidate. So I know one of the things, one of the, one of the, one of the big things that some tax professionals even forget to look at because they're either new or just don't know is the CSET dates. That's one thing that they just, you gotta go look at the CSET dates. They're about to expire. Why are you doing an offer? <laughs> Does that make sense? So, yeah, so, so when you're interviewing a client initially uh, with any tax problem, whether, you know, whether it's just a large liability, whether they have unfiled tax returns, um, you know, there are certain things that have to be done um, in establishing whether this person even qualifies for an offer and compromise. Uh, certainly the CSED dates are one thing you want to look at. Uh, CSED, for those who don't know, is the collection statute expiration date. Uh, and every tax liability has a 10-year statute of limitations within which those taxes, once assessed, will expire. Uh, and that's 10 years from when you file, uh, when the taxes are assessed, once you file that return, or if other taxes are assessed later, for example, from an audit. Uh, and you always want to examine, you know, look, if I have someone who's got a tax liability that is going to expire in eight months, um, why am I going to put them through the offer process uh, if their tax liability is going to expire eight months from now. And the problem is, is that offer process is going to toll that statute of limitations. So it's very important for practitioners to really do a perfect analysis of all of this, of the collection statute expiration dates. And you have to know not only what the expiration dates are, when those taxes were assessed, but the rules that govern when taxes expire. So that's the first thing we do. The second thing we're going to do is I'm going to do an, a financial analysis of each client. Uh, and the first questions I'm going to ask are, do you own any real estate? Do you have any investments? I need to establish for an offer and compromise uh, what this person's assets are, what their equity is in the world, because that's part of an offer. Uh, and then I also need to establish what their income is and what their expenses are uh, so that we can determine exactly what their offer is going to be. In my best of all worlds, I want a client who's going to do an offer to be upside down with their income and expenses or very nearly close to that. Uh, it doesn't mean they won't qualify for an offer if, they're, if their cash flow is positive, but it means that their offer is going to be higher. They're going to have to offer more money to get that offer accepted. So in the first case I told you about where we ended up with a $30,000 settlement, well, the taxpayer had some assets. And so ultimately, uh, we did have to up that offer from what I had originally offered to the $30,000. But 
Still, to settle at 10 cents on the dollar for a $300,000 liability, he was thrilled. Oh, fantastic. So what is, um, uh, what do you see, because uh, I know that you, you've worked at, uh, you're in, independent now, but you've worked at, at, at uh, a number of the larger firms, our, our tax resolution companies. What do you see the mistakes that uh, most tax practitioners make uh, especially nowadays, um, some of the uh, mm-hmm. younger uh, people coming into the business. Um, because what sure. happens, what a lot of people don't realize is that sometimes uh, they may have gone to another tax practitioner. The tax, tax practitioner submitted the, the taxpayer for an offer and compromise. Uh, and they did it wrong. And, uh, you, you know, that, that process can take 18 months sometimes. And then all of a sudden, they're on yeah. the phone with you. You pull records. You see, well, you get the scoop. Well, uh, they, this is what they, this is what that tax tax practitioner did wrong when they filed your offer. We, I, I, I can see where we can get this taken care of. So, what are some of the common things that you might might see in that case uh, from uh, the clients being with a previous tax practitioner? Sure. Well, there's a number of things. The first thing is. Uh, and, and, you know, taxpayers particularly want to be particularly aware of this is, does the tax practitioner have too much work to be handled, to be able to handle an offer and compromise? Because the amount of time involved to properly evaluate and prepare and submit an offer and compromise and then walk it through the process, uh, it can be significant. Um, so that's the first thing um, that a lot of taxpayers are going to make mistakes on um, is just taking on too much work. The second thing is not knowing the rules that govern offers and compromise. I see so many uh, people come to me uh, who've had their offers rejected uh, because they went with another practitioner, or another firm that didn't know what they were doing, submitted improperly, uh, didn't understand the rules. It doesn't mean they didn't qualify. It just means that the offer was not packaged properly. Uh, there are certain things that you need to do uh, in order for that offer to get through the system. And if you know what you're doing and you do it properly and do it right the first time, you're not going to end up necessarily in an appeal. You're not going to necessarily get immediately rejected. Uh, You want to get to the point where the offer examiner who's assigned your case is going back and forth with you on different issues. Um, So that's the first thing that I see, you know, people doing. The other thing is that practitioners don't know what to offer. Um, You know, sometimes they're just going to say, well, let's offer $5,000 when maybe that person would have qualified to have an offer of just $1,000. you know, that's that's a big mistake that I see a lot of practitioners make. They don't understand how the system works. And there is a very particular process that an offer and compromise is evaluated by, both in terms of assets and in terms of income and expenses. Uh, and it's very similar to other government codes that cover financials, for example, in bankruptcy. Some of the rules are very similar. Yeah. And the, the nice thing is that an offer and compromise is not going to hurt your credit. <laughs> It's actually going to fix your credit. And, and that's the thing. The, the, the devil is in the details whenever you're dealing with the items. And so many so many tax practitioners, they don't take the time to do the research. And if you don't do the research, you're never going to get the experience. Now, we had talked earlier today, and you had also mentioned that there are different types of offers or structures of offer and compromises. And uh, uh, one what may be an example of what's the proper way to do it for a specific client situation versus another. Do you have any examples like that? Sure. Yeah. So the most common type of offer is what we call a doubt as to collectability. So that's where we look at a taxpayer's liability. Um, We say, okay, let's say this person owes, you know, $50,000. The next step is we're going to look at their assets um, and this is, sorry, this is doubt as collectability. Um, so, you know, the question is, what is the reasonable collection potential uh, for the IRS against this person? And in order for the IRS to establish that, they're going to look at assets, they're going to look at income, and they're going to look at allowable expenses. So um, the first type of offer, like I said, is the doubt as to collectability, where the person simply will never be able to pay off this debt. And the purpose of the offer is co- offering compromise. The reason it was created many years ago 
was because the government want, does not want people to be beholden to the government and in debt to the government forever uh, with these large amounts because people who don't owe large amounts of money to the IRS are more productive. They contribute to the society. They make more money in business. Uh, we give people an opportunity to get out of their tax trouble to learn from their mistakes. And so that's a doubt as to collectability. And basically what that means is the IRS will accept a settlement on your liability that is basically a percentage or a smaller amount of what you owe based on your assets in the world added up with your positive cash flow. And again, for a lot of my clients that we get these through, they're already upside down, but they don't have to be. Um, so for example, if someone's cash flow is $500 positive each month after we allow for food, clothing, rent, or mortgage, uh, car payments, things like that, um, then we look at that. Let's say they're $500 positive. We multiply that by 12. Uh, it gives us $6,000. That could be an offer and compromise on a $100,000 debt. And so people have to understand how to put these packages together. So that's a doubt as to collectability. The next offer is called a doubt as to liability, where the person thinks they don't even owe the tax, that something went wrong either with an audit or with um, you know other processes, and not an audit that went all the way to, to the finish, finish, but where there was something that went on um, that they don't think they owe this tax, or they never did do uh, there never was an audit, but they simply owe the tax. Um, and for some reason, something has come up that they don't owe it. Um, and that's so that's a doubt as to liability. And you can literally go to the IRS and say, look, I have a reason that this client doesn't owe this money. And here's why. Uh, it wasn't his debt in the first place. Uh, he was audited, but, you know, this uh, this never finished and he doesn't owe this debt. Uh, there was a mistake. So you can literally go to them and say he doesn't owe this money. Finally, there's what's called effective tax administration. And I am using this in a case right now <clears throat> where the taxpayer says to the IRS, look, I owe you this money and I have the money to pay it or some of it or most of it. But for this reason, there's a reason that I have that I can't pay it all and I shouldn't be made to pay it all. Medical situations, um, you know, other situations where you need that money, you might need that money in the future. Uh, this is easier with elderly people. Uh, people have uh, mental health issues or or physical health issues uh, where you can get an offer through, even though the person has the assets to pay the di liability, where you say to the government, look, they need this money for the future. And this is, you know, this is why they need it. Please accept this settlement to allow them to continue to have a good right. life. And, and that's I'm glad that you brought that up, Randy, because a lot of tax practitioners uh, don't uh, may not take into consideration uh, a person may be disabled, they might be, you know, had a, I remember I had a, uh, a taxpayer that was 97 years old, you know, the, and I want to talk about that because a lot of people call, especially young people, they'll contact uh, someone in the ta tax community or tax resolution community, and they're, 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 believe it or not, um, they're, they're, they're very young. They can be uh, uh, 27, you know, early 30s, single, no kids. And they want to, mm -hmm. they always say, I want to offer and compromise. I've watched television late at night and I've seen thousands of commercials that say you can just cancel out my $6,000 debt with an offer and compromise. So, so I kind of want to go over that. Um, what is, what's the youngest you have have seen a gotten an offer and compromise accepted through because most of the time if someone's under the age of say under the age of 35 let's say for sure uh i, I really have to scrutinize mm -hmm. things to determine whether they're a true offering can uh, offer and compromise candidate because all their earning years are right. ahead of them so what's the youngest that you've ever found to, to get an offer through and what were the circumstances sure so i had i actually had a younger person i had someone who was 32 um, it's not always the flat out rule that a younger person is not going to get an offer accepted. It certainly helps if you're older. Uh, and the reason is this for a younger person, if they owe a certain amount of money to the IRS and the IRS looks at them and says, look, you're young enough where you can pay this liability for the next 10 years or eight years or whatever the statute is. And, you know, we think you, you can do this and, you know, granting you an offer is just not in the best interest of the government because we think we can collect it. It doesn't mean that younger people won't qualify for an offer. 
if they if they um, have no assets, if their income is minimal, if their expenses are eating up most of their income, and you know they don't have they're not a trust fund baby or something like that, um, it's very possible to get someone through an offer process. The offer process is not age restrictive. It's just easier to get someone through who's older. So the person I'm doing the effective tax administration offer on right now happens to be 60 years old and has some very serious illnesses. Uh, they want to have the funds they have put away to take care of him as he gets older. And it makes perfect sense to me. Um, I've done two of these. The first one I got accepted, um, and it was for someone also with a child who had some very severe uh, health issues. Um, and, you know, they're not often accepted, but if you do them right, uh, they, they are. They can be. So I, I believe Nicole had a question for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So we're just wondering, sure. uh, like, what are some of the limitations on offers that, that uh, you've dealt with? Sure. So the first thing, you know, that they're always going to look at is is assets. So we look at assets. We're going to look at real estate. Uh, they're going to look at vehicles. Um, the nice thing is, is they do give you a little bit of a break. Um, you know, vehicles are valuated. They ask you, what is the market value? They're obviously going to take away any value that you owe on the car. Um, and then they have a certain amount that they allow um, for assets like that so that they subtract. Uh, same with bank accounts or investments. If you have a small bank account, let's say with a you know $1,200 in it, the IRS will subtract 1000 of that, assuming that money is spoken for. So that's not going to be considered part of your offer. But here's the problem. If you own real estate, Let's say you own a house, and of course, home values home values have skyrocketed recently. Um, you know, so if you have, let's say, three or four hundred thousand dollars equity in a home, which is not very difficult, really, anywhere in America, uh, if you bought, you know, in the last uh, ten years, um, or even before that, uh, and you owe, owe less than that to the IRS, it's going to be very hard to get an offer through because that equity in the home is considered part of your offer. And practitioners need to be aware of that because if you're, I've had so many clients come to me where the former tax practitioner did an offer where someone had a hundred thousand dollars equity in their home and didn't even consider it, you know, and when they, and then they offered a hundred dollars <laughs> to settle the case. And I was looking at, it, I'm asking myself, why would you make an offer where someone has a hundred thousand dollars in equity? You know, you have to somehow consider that. Um, but there, but there are other things like that that you just, those are, so there's some of the limitations that you have to remember. Other limitations are on expenses. So for example, um, uh, mileage on your vehicle, people are allowed a certain operating expense on their cars. And so for most states, let's say in the, in the Western United States, that amount of money that they allow per month for insurance, maintenance, and gas is going to be somewhere between 250 to $350 per month. That doesn't sound like very much uh, for operating a car and paying insurance when some people are paying $150 to $200 per month just for insurance. And, of course, gas prices are also up. So the way around that is what if I have someone who's commuting far to work? I just got a client who's commuting 45 miles to work each way, 100 miles a day, okay? Let's say an average of 20 uh, or 22 work days in a month. You're talking about, you know, 2,200 miles a month they're putting on their vehicle. So that has to be accepted by the IRS. They can't say to your, to your taxpayer, oh, well, you can't commute to work. Wouldn't make any sense. So that's the kind of thing where that limitation we can overcome. Another limitation is food and clothing. You know, they only allow a certain amount for food and clothing and, you know, personal miscellaneous items, home care, cleaning supplies. It's about $785 uh, right now per month. Most people hear that, they're like, well, how can anyone live on $785 per month? Well, it's certainly doable, but what if you're uh, in a category of people that spend more on food for whatever reason? Uh, I've had taxpayers come to me who are diabetic, who need special food. Uh, taxpayers have other health conditions where they need special food. Um, and uh, some taxpayers with certain religious uh, uh, food restrictions. They spend more on food. And in numerous occasions, I have been able to get those offers through by upping the allowance on the food. An extra $100 or $200 a month can save you, uh, you know, $2,400, $2,500 a year uh, in what they consider allowable expenses. So very important to know those nuances Absolutely. when you're doing an offer. What, what um, uh, through the years, there have been times where I know I personally have, have had 
clients that I'm examining their situation where they may have had a previous tax, pay, tax practitioner uh, do an offer for them and it failed. And I go, wait a minute. And I go back to the, the time where they were originally uh, working with that tax pra practitioner. And I go, I don't understand. I don't understand why your tax practitioner just didn't recommend bankruptcy because you would have qualified for bankruptcy <laughs> at that time. Why did they sure. recommend that? Have you have you seen that from time to time as well, Randy? Sure, absolutely. I, I see tax practitioners who will recommend an offer when someone does qualify for bankruptcy. And it is absolutely mandatory that any practitioner, whether you're an attorney, whether you're a CPA, whether you're an enrolled agent, that you properly evaluate the taxpayer situation. You cannot lead someone astray and maintain your ethics. And if you don't, if you're not ethical, you're gonna get in trouble with the Office of Professional Responsibility. And that's important to know. So you have to evaluate when you look at someone's, now there are reasons someone may want to do an offer instead of a bankruptcy, and that's fair, but you still have to put the option before them. If they qualify for bankruptcy and they can wipe out their tax debt just by filing versus offering amount, you know, $50,000 on an offer, that may make sense for them. In most cases that I, people I talk to, they're gonna want to do the offer because it wipes out their tax debt, it wipes out their tax liens. Those go away with an offer once it's accepted. So, but I still have to talk with them about the option of bankruptcy. And certainly if someone doesn't qualify for an offer, I may say to them, you know what? Let's look at bankruptcy because I have bankruptcy attorneys I work with who do nothing but, and I will recommend clients to them to look at their tax debt. A lot of practitioners don't even know that, you know, who just do tax preparation, that taxes are bankruptable. There are rules to follow, but they can be bankrupted after a certain amount of time. Um, so that's very important for tax practitioners to know uh, the rules there. The other rule is, well, what if your client isn't going to offer qualify for an offer at all? Uh, then they may qualify for a good, uh, you know, uh, payment plan and maybe having their penalties abated. And you need to evaluate that as well. Don't you know, don't charge a client a ton of money and try to put them through an offer that you know they're not going to qualify for. That's just not proper. And so many practitioners that I see are making offers in compromise because they don't understand the situation. They don't understand the process of doing an offer. Yes. Uh, very good. One of the, one of the things that uh, uh, many times uh, practitioners run into is when you have uh couples who have been married and they've been divorced. And, you know, I, it's, it's kind of frustrating when you're working with couples who have, who have just gone through a divorce. Maybe the divorce is post one year, two year, three years. And either going in the divorce, out of the divorce, whether they knew there was tax debt or not. But um, there, there are many times where one spouse will, one of the spouses will, will submit for an offer and compromise, get accepted. And the the other spouse is uh, they have some they have some fascinating to say. Does that mean that that the debt was forgiven for me too? And also they go, how come it, it it wasn't even my debt? It was his debt that he got it forgiven, and now they're coming after me. Can I do an offer compromise too? I go, no. You met you're you're married to Elon Musk. Yeah. <laughs> you know situations like things like that, and you see that often. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, do you, do you have oh, yeah. any insider mm -hmm. thoughts on that? Because well, they, they mirror the account. The sure. account gets mirrored. And, and when one does Yeah, that is what it's right. called, called mirroring. So the first thing to know is that when a couple gets divorced, um, their tax liability is joint and several. So if you have a couple who's filed married filing joint uh, for the last 10 years and they owe debt on any or all of those years, once they are separated, um, each of them owes the total amount of the debt to the IRS um, separately. And the IRS collects against both of them equally. And basically what we always say in the industry is whoever pays <laughs> first loses. Because if you pay off, let's say you have $100,000 debt in a, for a couple, and the husband suddenly decides he's going to pay off $75,000 of that debt, $75,000 of the ex-wife's uh, liability will also go away. 
uh, this happens in a number of tax liability situations, not just, um, you know, not just regular income tax. Um, but there are numerous situations where you have uh, taxes where one person pays off the debt and uh, some other entity benefits or some other person benefits from that payoff. So that's the first thing is that once you separate, you're on your own and the IRS can collect the whole amount. doesn't matter if you say, well, we agreed in the divorce that we were going to split the tax debt or my husband agreed that he was going to pay it off. Guess what? The IRS does not care at all. Uh, each of you is responsible once you file that tax liability return. Um, you know, you're responsible for the whole amount. If you get divorced, you're on your own. I do have some situations where I will represent both taxpayers uh, who I've worked with before they got divorced. And in order for me to do that, I actually have to enter right. into a conflict of interest waiver. Uh, and it's only where I really think it's appropriate and where the taxpayers are amicable and which I, I can rely on that. Um, then I can do an offer and compromise for each of them if they qualify. Um, but there'll be situations where it's just one spouse coming to. Um, and if we settle that spouse's liability, they need to know that the other spouse will still be responsible uh, if that tax debt is not settled in some way. Uh, and that's going to happen. Sometimes you're going to have one spouse who has less financial means than the other or less assets than the other uh, after the divorce. And you have to know that when that person gets their offer accepted, the other spouse is going to be kind of out in the cold. So... That's why I sometimes will represent both taxpayers, again, especially if it's an amicable divorce where they're getting along. <laughs> if it's not getting along, I don't touch it. Good idea. <laughs> well, well, Randy, uh, we, we would love to have you back sometime to discuss more about offering compromises or even some uh, another topic or subject. Uh, once again, thank you so much for being uh, our first guest. It's very important. Um, and you've given a, a wealth of information. Uh, could you go ahead and just, uh, uh, we'll post this at the end of the show as well, but could you go ahead and just tell the folks uh, out there in our tax resolution professional community uh, how they might be able to get a hold of you or view your work or your, your website for sure? Sure. Yeah. So they can visit my website at taxreliefclinic.com. Uh, and that has a wealth of information about all the different uh, programs uh, that we represent taxpayers on. Um, so, again, it's uh, www.taxreliefclinic.com. Uh, and then also, if they want to call, uh, we have an 800 number, which is 800-844-7750. Uh, again, it's 800-844-7750. They can call me for questions or to review a client's case, uh, you know, if they're interested in referring someone over. And uh Listen, Randy, you are so good at this. I don't understand why you don't have a YouTube yes. channel. You know, <laughs> we could be on it. You're, 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 you're on fabulous. It. And uh, that's one of the things I admired about you is you're Appreciate able to articulate you. things uh, in, in terms of taxes to, to just about anyone, a lay person or someone who has experience, you know, 30 years experience. You just do it so well and yes. so 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 powerfully and meaningful. And you cover all the details. So we're very excited to have you uh, on our first episode, first interview episode. Yes. Uh, we would love to have you back uh, as soon as we can, Randy. You were fantastic. Of course, I okay. appreciate it. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Nicole and I are going to go ahead and sign off. Once again, uh, you can visit our website, uh, taxwarsusa.com. Uh, we'll also uh, put up information in terms of uh, how you might be able to get a hold of Mr. Salter via his website, and we'll put uh, his website link in the description box below. And even if you have questions for Mr. Salter, you go ahead and feel free to put them in the comment box, and uh, he can uh, come along and uh, view this episode once it's posted. And once again... Uh, we'll be uh, in Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, we'll be we'll be doing some taping. Yes. I don't know if we're going to do lives or you know uh, while we're down there in Las Vegas or not. But uh, we'll certainly have some episodes that we're going to be uh, posting while we're in Las Vegas at the N E A E convention. And um, uh, so, and if you're going to be attending, be sure to look for us down there. In the meantime, don't forget to hit the like button the subscribe button, and please uh, feel free to put uh, comments, ask questions as well. We're, once again, we're trying to grow out this channel. Yes. Okay? 
until then, uh, we probably won't, uh, you probably won't see us until we're in Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> All righty. All right. Remember what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, no, actually, <laughs> what happens in Vegas is what happens in Vegas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's, that, she tells a different story here. Have fun, okay. guys. Randy, thanks again. Once again, we look forward to having you back. Again. Yes, thank All you. All right. We're going to go ahead and sign off now. All right. Sure. Okay, Randy. Thanks. Nice but you to were, meet you, you were, Randy.